Today's topic is how to be a good AI programmer. My name is Guillaume Chevalier, and I'm the Machine Learning Director at Neuraxio Inc. So this is part of the AI programmer uh, certificate. So it's a technical training with certificate that takes 10 hours to uh, optionally 50 to complete. You can get it on my website. I'll paste the link uh, right now there so that you can have it guys in the chat. So let's get started. So here today is a smaller version of that to just overview uh, some content that I've created and uh, also curated from some other places. So first, the usual journey of a programmer. So how does a programmer start being good and, and getting to be the perfect AI programmer and moving on to other goals? Uh, use test-driven development. TDD, this is a must for AI programming and especially for, let's say, less risky projects where uh, you want to ser serve a client and have a really clear goal of where you want to go and you want to make sure it will go to production. Uh, sometimes for financial applications, testing your application can be very important. And uh, for big, large scale applications, you want to be sure to have write your solid principles of oriented object programming applied to machine learning. You also want to have some good package design techniques if you're building frameworks, libraries, or just simply uh, architecturing big code bases. You can go read some awesome lists and also learn design patterns and do automated machine learning. So this is uh, what I will be talking about today. So let's get started with the usual journey of a programmer. So I would say an entry level programmer is doing at the first point there, a coding project or many coding projects. So it is about pure code writing. Sometimes there's a little bit decision making into this, but uh, it's mostly about being order what to do. Or sometimes you choose to do what you want when you do personal projects to make your portfolio better as I did in the past. Uh, so before machine learning was really uh, a thing. <laughs> so another thing you can do is talks and conferences. So uh, this will probably emerge naturally as, a, as your journey gets, let's say, towards higher goals or, well, uh, you will start choosing the dependencies in your projects and you will be actually planning and designing projects with the experience that you've gained. So after that, uh, a level three, let's say AI programmer would be creating a framework. So using some patterns that you've learned from different projects, applying things again and again and again, redoing things again, you will see things that are clearly the basis of any project that you will be working on later. So you will start kind of creating a framework or let's say some uh, pre-made code files that you will reuse from project to project. And this is the, 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 the time and place where you will be starting some kind of frameworks uh, that are sometimes open source or somewhat, so sometimes it is about frameworkizing <laughs> your code base uh, in your company by adding some kind of framework-like functionalities. So uh, it is putting into code the common thoughts, thought processes and coding processes that you've discovered and uh, making them more readily available for a reuse. For what regards test-driven development, so what I see a lot is machine learning uh, engineers or machine learning uh, programmers or stuff like that who just jump into machine learning and don't actually take the time to learn how to program correctly. And I think that one part of programming correctly is doing test-driven development. For any project that will be longer than a month, you will get more speed in the long run by adopting test-driven development. But if it's a small research project or a small one-off project, you might not need to uh, get into test-driven development. But 
uh, a test is structured into three parts. Uh, they are called the AAA steps of a unit test. So the first one is arrange, and then there's act and assert. So when you arrange a test, you want to create variables or constants to use later on in the test. So these variables can be extracted uh, to other files that you can import uh, if your test reuse variables of other tests, let's say. You can have even have uh, some builder design patterns or stuff like that to create your test setups. And then you will act. So you call the code that you want to test. And uh, to do that, you call, let's say, the object and some function of it. And you pass your arranged variables or constants. And then you assert. So you verify that the result that you obtain is as you would expect. So below is a small unit test. And you can clearly see the three parts with the uh, the line spacing of the test. So in the first place, you arrange the, the test. So you get your machine learning pipeline, let's say. And then in second, you act. So you transform some data. And then at the step three, you will assert something uh, to be sure that the, uh, let's say, predictions are as expected or that the pipeline did some action that you wanted to take. Now, for what regards the solid principles, these are oriented object principles that you, uh, I think, will really, uh, you, you really get to use them when you do code reviews or receive them. And it, it's really cool and really cool and really good to see uh, moments when you can say in the code review, aha, that is the, let's say, single responsibility principle that is in case there. And that's a, a, a valid uh, concept to justify some change that needs to be done in some critical code, let's say that, uh, especially in machine learning frameworks, things needs to be well tested because uh, hundreds of projects will be based uh, on top of this framework. So everything needs to be uh, well designed and accessible and good. So these principles are especially uh, important in uh, uh, central objects or in uh, important objects of big code bases. So there's the SRP, uh, basically one object does one thing, one function does one thing, uh, you, you get it. There's the OCP, open closed principle. Objects must be closed to modification, but open to extension. So in your code, if you see lots of if else, if else with some conditions, you can have the reflex of thinking, wow, okay, there I use some kind of abstract object that I've passed and depending on its instance, the, the if else will act automatically without having to manually do the if else. So uh, objects can are, you know, objects are open to extension. You can extend them by inheriting with other objects uh, to pass them around and avoid doing some switch cases that would be really bad in the long run. So you have the list of substitution principle. So this is basically about having an object that you can replace with another object of the same base type from what you inherit from. And uh, for instance, take a machine learning model on some pre-processed data, just change the object of the model to pass a different model, and your code should still be able to work the same way with the different model if the, if the different model is of the same type of, let's say, uh, inputs and outputs. And uh, let's say that you also do some optimization onto that to choose the model. So there's the ISP, Interface Segregation Principle. Um, this is to differentiate what you're inheriting from, because at some point, you will inherit so much from some abstract classes or some interfaces that if you put everything in the same class or everything in the same interface, you will get uh, with a code base uh, that is really... Uh, not pleasant to use because you have some god objects that are so big and when it happens you need to split them apart into different objects and so your let's say child class that inherits from its two parent classes uh, uh, so, uh in, in this case you would have uh your object in everything from various different classes or interface to uh combine them and some object will inherit only from one or from two or from three interfaces, and you can recombine them in different ways. And uh, sometimes, instead of using interfaces, you can use some mix-ins and advanced design pattern and some 
uh, wrappers or decorators. There's nice stuff going on there that you can do. There's the dependency inversion principle. Uh, that's an important one when you just uh, inject some uh, dependencies into your code. Uh, so as like passing objects to other functions instead of, or passing objects to some uh, other objects functions instead of digging uh, into your objects and doing the work and resending it. So it is related to the tell don't ask principle uh, of Martin Fowler. And the tell don't ask is basically tell your object what to do with what you have uh, on hands instead of digging into your objects to uh, leak its internal mechanic and doing the work manually and putting it back into the object. You should not do that. You, you just take what you have and you send it to the object and you say, do this so you, you tell you don't ask um and so once you grasp really the importance and the mechanics of all those principles you will get uh to a place where you design really good code uh really intuitively for your uh, clients or for your project and you will really uh find it easier in the long run to do some projects like that so uh there's a must read article that uh uh, I find it's on the blog of Humaneo, uh, a startup in Quebec, and it's about the solid principles applied to machine learning. Also, uh, oh, I think the TDD slide is there uh, at some... Okay, uh, so next up is the package design techniques. So these techniques are uh, very interesting when your project scales. So you have ways to analyze the internal package structure as well as the interactions between your packages. And by package, I mean a folder containing many different, uh, let's say, Python files, okay? So uh, for the intra package structure, there's, for instance, uh, the common reuse uh, principle here. Uh, and uh, it says that classes that are used together are packaged together. That is a good thing to do. It seems really obvious, but sometimes, uh, uh, well, uh, I think everybody here have seen some ugly code bases and sometimes it's not like that. And the common closer principle is similar. Classes that change together are packaged together. And for the release reuse equivalency principle, uh, I won't get into detail uh, for this one because I don't have time. Um, but for uh, the inter-package structures, there's the acyclic dependencies principle. This one, you've probably already met it at some point if you're programming uh, for at least a bit of time. Uh, your, dependency, you, your dependency graph should have no cycles. So uh, your imports should be like a, a directed acyclic graph. <laughs> and um, so for this, um, you know, you just don't do an object that imports another one and another object imports another one back. And, and it's not like this. So uh, this will lead to problems in the long run. There's also the stable dependencies principle. This one is, uh, is sometimes very intuitive for some people. And for some other people, it's not intuitive. And I don't know why really some people really get this one or not, but shortly explained, uh, you should depend in the direction of stability. So let's say you have a, a, an object that is really important in your code base. And um, let's say that everyone imports this object already and everyone does some work on this object already. Uh, let's say an object as, uh, as general and as stable as the concept of money itself. So you have an object that is named money. And uh, this object is imported by the invoice class. It's imported by the uh, transaction class. There's like lots of objects importing the money, um, let's say, or money amount class. And uh, given that this class is very stable, you should depend on this class by importing it. And please do not have this massive class used everywhere. Do not have this class import many other things because this will make your code uh, really hell uh, when you will do some changes. Uh, as soon as you will do one change on your money class, everything that imports it will need to change. And this will do like a, a big uh, octopus having tentacles everywhere and pulling onto your code. So uh, you should depend on the octopus and not have the octopus 
import everything, let's say. So uh, you should have invoice importing money and do and add a function in the invoice to process the money instead of adding a new function in the money class to process an incoming invoice. So be wary of where you place your code and where you import the other objects. There's also the stable abstractions principle. So abstractness increases with stability. So uh, probably that your money amount class uh, at some point will have, <laughs> I see an octopus icon in the chat, very nice one. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, as abstractness increases with stability, so probably your money amount class uh, will have like Canadian money amount and uh, USD money amount and stuff like that. So it will become abstract with the time and different implementations will naturally emerge from this uh, if you do your code right instead of everywhere doing if conditions for the uh, rate changes and stuff like that so uh, there's a very interesting article by uncle bob on this so it's on uh, but uncle Go um, but uncle bob.com and it's it's in the old articles section uh, the principles of oriented object design you can read awesome lists or build your own one. So here's my awesome list. Uh, I've started building it, I think it was four years ago or maybe even already five years ago uh, when machine learning and deep learning weren't uh, really cool yet or were starting to get cool. Uh, so I was reading so many papers and so many watching so many YouTube videos uh, about mathematics instead of actually um, attending my classes. I got good grades, by the way, but uh, I did this. And uh, I've just listed here my favorite resources for people to read if they wanted. I did not put just simply everything. Those are curated resources that have helped me advance my understanding, I would say, especially in the realm of digital signal processing, working with complex numbers and Fourier transforms and stuff like that. Uh, that is not taught in every engineering schools, unfortunately, in uh, software engineering uh, curriculums. So uh, nowadays, uh, uh, two topics are, I think, quite important for machine learning when working with time series data. You can learn uh, some design patterns. So I will name a few that will be very important in machine learning. Uh, to the left, there's pipe and filter. There's the state design pattern, service locator, composite, and decorator. And if you combine all of these uh, design patterns together, you get a machine learning pipeline with uh, lots of funky things going on. Uh, I think I have a slide later on uh, with examples and you will kind of see how the pipe and filter fits into the composite design pattern with some decorators and some state that can be fitted and stuff like that. Uh, very important design patterns, although I, I don't have the time to get into the details. There are also some framework design patterns that are um, very, um, let's say, spread across various frameworks. So I have designed, by the way, my own machine learning framework, Neuraxel, and uh, it is only after finding that this article that is linked uh, at the bottom of the screen, um, this article about framework design patterns, and I read that it was on the first page of Acu News, and I was like, wow, that, that's actually quite accurate. So when designing my framework, I've naturally come up with using these patterns uh, that are framework design patterns. So really interesting patterns. Uh, so there's the callback functions. You can see this with TensorFlow and Keras and many other frameworks. Uh, Subclassing for sure is, uh, is a must. Interfaces as well. There are some imperative uh, registration APIs, such as for saving and loading your models and stuff like that, and defining some uh, general purpose uh, let's say interfaces that people can inherit from and just send into the framework like some similarity to some callbacks. This is very interesting and, uh, and more. So uh, nice design patterns to learn. So you can also do automated machine learning 
also uh, called AutoML. So here is finally an example of a very nice machine learning pipeline, okay? So uh, you see here the pipeline equals the class pipeline open bracket. And here you would send a list of steps to process in sequential order. So uh, as per the uh, pipe and filter design pattern, into this, you would get other steps uh, combining other steps uh, and, and so forth, like wrappers or decorators or uh, classes of the same thing that are like the composite design pattern uh, that you can see here that is also used as uh, components in, in, in UI design. Let's say if you are speaking uh, uh, the uh, words of the languages of, uh, let's say, uh, of the frameworks, uh, let's say React Native and Vue.js and stuff like that. You, you see components in UI. Here it's a very good comparison for machine learning. So we can have some pre-processing, fast Fourier transforms, uh, feature of first union of other transforms, like uh, FFT uh, peak bins with values, and uh, so mean, median, min, maxes, and stuff like that. And you all join that with some kind of uh, way to merge this together that is another class and when everything is a class like this it's uh really amazing to work with code like that it is so flexible you can uh, really add lots of functionalities within that and here see below in the highlighted section a choose one step of so this is a class that uh have the role of choosing a classifier and using it so as per the uh, Liskov substitution principle here, every classifier can be interchanged there for the automated machine learning optimization that automatically chooses the model and automatically finds the best hyperparameters of the models. Uh, when we fit that uh, again and again with different hyperparameters, one hyperparameter being the choice of the model, well, it's, it's possible to uh, do a lot of things automatically just by launching the, uh, the optimization. So very nice design patterns um, are, I would say, a must for doing automated machine learning the right way. Your code must be well-structured enough to uh, get to this level of complexity. You could also choose the different features and have some hyperparameters as well on the feature themselves with some setup like that. So. To conclude, you can get all the learning resources and more uh, that I haven't even got the time to discuss. Uh, and there's also a small certificate if you pass the test. So it's here. You can go to uh, Neraxial's blog to look for or top learning resources for AI programmers. Are you seeing specific trends? Are you seeing clients coming to you with specific problems? Um, just across the board in regards to the work you're doing at the moment? that uh, there is a lot of need for se uh, for senior MLOps and senior data engineers and senior machine learning uh, engineers. I think the easiest positions to fulfill are always positions of people knowing the basics of machine learning and the basics of programming and more rare positions arise when it is time to uh, deploy that into production and manage different servers and also interact with the databases and refining the data and stuff like this. Uh, I see mm -hmm. some companies wanting to apply uh, more and more some machine learning technologies to various problems also in the uh, the biological, uh, let's say, industry uh, mm -hmm. where people are editing DNA and stuff like that to uh, find yeah, drug like discovery that. and yeah, proteins and more small. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Progress, uh, pro progress on this side, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I would say uh, that's it.